The spirit that rebuilt the South is evident everywhere you look in Atlanta, Georgia. Grand mansions still grace Buckhead and Peachtree Street, but Atlanta's place in the modern cosmopolitan world is renowned as the business hub of the Sun Belt. This progressive atmosphere extends through all aspects of life, including Atlanta's fuse box. In today's program, Troy Thompson turns fresh vegetables into a feast for the eyes with an exotic Japanese stew that's both simple and delightful tasting. Then he blends the flavors of India to create a curry hot pot. And then Regina learns the history of the popular Vidalia onion as she tours the Georgia countryside and later joins Chef Joseph Tushler at the Four Seasons for a lesson on candied citrus peel. We're here in a really beautiful part of Atlanta called Buckhead, and I, I'm just thrilled with what we're going to be doing today. We're at the Fuse Box restaurant with Troy Thompson, and what you do here in the restaurant, your cuisine, and also your background, I think really reflects a lot of what's going on in Atlanta itself as a truly Absolutely. cosmopolitan city. Absolutely. We, yeah. we, we try to bring out the flavors of whatever, what, what people bring to us, and, and the, the local vegetables that the farmers bring to us. We try to, we try to make... Uh, unique flavors and unique styles of cooking just in, in its simplest forms. Well, and your background is very classically trained European, French, European cuisine, but also Troy spent a couple of years in Japan. So I think the dish we're going to be working on uh, first certainly reflects the time you had in Japan when you were a young and wild thing. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. This is actually a dish from, um, it's, it's a very country dish from Japan. It's called a, a nabe. Um, a nabi basically means a stew, and, and what we're doing is we, we went to the farmer's market, we, we, we got all the beautiful vegetables, the Chinese vegetables, Chinese um, uh, broccoli, nira flowers, some enoki mushrooms, wild chanterelles, um, we got tofu in there, asparagus, so basically any vegetable mm. will do. It is, it's full of, of flavor, simplistics. Um, and, and what this is, it's just a stew. Um, our basics of this dish is the, the beautiful vegetables, and then we put a vegetable stock in it. So, But a little different twist to the vegetable stock. Exactly. Well, you know, it, it, what we do is we just let it simmer. Mm -hmm. we, we take beautiful vegetables itself, and not the, not the peelings and so on and so forth, but the whole vegetables, and we just let it simmer. I do put some dried shiitakes in there just to give it a robust flavor in there. Um, and what we end up doing is is arranging the dish itself. I got some I got some French lentils in here, mm -hmm. um, carrots, some fennel. Um, what we're going to end up doing is 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 pouring the stock over it um, and and let it cook for a little bit while I show you the other dish that we're going to do. And that's just kind of a, a, a variation of a oh, this is interesting of an Indian an Indian dish, an Indian vegetable dish. It's a, it has a little curry in it and it has a little spice in it. And this is, the, the, the vegetable nabe has a, has a little less spice in it. You can, you can obviously put a lot of spice to it if you want to, but. So, so what, we just let it cook down with just a small amount of broth in there? With a little bit of broth, Interesting. yes. Interesting. Because the, the vegetables itself has water in it. Right. And it's gonna release, release all the, the flavors itself. And it's gonna it's it's gonna marriage in there. It's gonna boil. It's gonna oh, simmer away. This is great. It's, it's, have a beautiful yeah. display. Pour a little broth on it, and there exactly. you have a dish. What what generally the, the the Japanese do? They take it to the table in a mm -hmm. little tiny little burner, and they cook it, and then they grab it and they eat it. You know, so it's 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 a wonderful dish Good. with a little bit of rice. So, so we'll a, let that very, cook, and then we'll start on the curry hot pot. Yes. Okay. Yes. And we have some interesting things going <clears> on <throat> here. Um, <clears throat> What? Maybe what you can do is start the dish, and then when we get to the ingredients that we want to chat about a little bit, we right. can chat about them. How's um, that? You can basically use any type of vegetable that you okay. have locally, um, but the spices are unique. Um, obviously, the Indian curries are, are full of flavors. They consist of coriander seeds, cumin, um, a little cayenne, turmeric, garlic, ginger, um, and what we do, that, this is probably the only time you're going to see oil, and what we use is a, is a healthy grapeseed oil. Oh, yeah. And it mm -hmm. has a high flame resistant. It doesn't, it takes a temperature very hot. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't burn off. You're not going to taste the oil. It's very neutral. If you use an olive oil like I have over here, it's, mm -hmm. you won't taste it, and you're just wasting the oil. So what, what I'm going to do is, is turn up the heat a little bit and get it smoking. I'm going to take a little bit of coriander seeds. 
basically what we're doing is, is sauteing it very hard. And this is something we've been seeing with a lot of the chefs is to make sure and either toast or saute um, a lot of the spices in advance just to really bring the flavor out. Right. <clears throat> Take a little cumin seed, do the same thing. And we're, we, are, we are sauteing it hot, very hot. We're gonna take the ginger in here. We're gonna, I like a little ginger in there, so I'm gonna put a good amount of ginger in there. Next, we're gonna take a little garlic. I'm just now beginning to smell it over yeah. here. Mm. Oh, it, 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 yeah. it, it definitely, I would always use like a cast iron skillet or something to do this in. Um, or a nicer, nicer Teflon pan if you don't if you don't use anything or to some scratch it with. Beautiful ceramic cookware. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Um, I put a little fresh turmeric in here, which gives it a little bit uh, um, sharper taste than the than the. I wanted to talk to you about that. Dried turmeric. Yeah, it's not very often we see um, fresh turmeric, and it looks like. It looks a little bit like dried out carrot. carrot. Yeah. <laughs> At first I thought, how can you have fresh carrot and dried out old carrot? <laughs> sure, it, it sure does. But it has it has such a unique flavor to it. It it almost has a it has a pungent carrot flavor to it. But it doesn't but it, add the color though. It, it in this will once it once once the liquid's in there, okay. it, it'll start to release okay. its uh, a little fashion. I pu I put a little uh, hot pepper. It's uh, cayenne pepper yeah. in there, just a little bit to make it. Uh, Go. A little spiciness. You're to the it. first person I've seen use fresh turmeric. And then we're going to put a little apple in here, a little Granny Smith apple. Oh. Just to what? Cool it Just, off, give it, it a little it sweetness? It gives it or a something? little sweetness to mm -hmm. it. We take the onions, put it all in there. And I am going to use a little bit of carrot also. And that also gives it a little bit of what we're going to do with this dish is puree it up. And that gives it the the, the thickness that the, mm -hmm. the vegetables, once you pour it on the vegetables, like I said before, it, it releases all the flavors to it and all the juices, and it does get thinned down a little bit. Mm -hmm. What I'm going to do Now, I see you have a couple different kinds it. of salt here. Yep. This I looks have, more like I almost a, a kosher salt. I have a, a, well, it's a, that's a coarse sea salt, mm -hmm. and what I use for that is for cooking. And what I use, um, I have Fleur de Sel over here from, from Brittany, France. And what I do with that is I use that for flavoring at, at the end. Mm. This is really mild. It's a salt that doesn't, it doesn't taste very salty. And you can see it has a, it's almost a flake rather than a grain. And it's a little bit moist. This isn't something that you would be able to uh, shake out of a, a shaker. You have to pinch it. Right. It's right. a wonderful flavor. Okay. So it's fleur de sel. It's fleur de sel. It, it's the top layer of the, the ocean salt, the ocean. It's the primo salt, and, and it's, uh, it's very expensive. It's about 30 bucks a pound, so. And we only, always use it for flavoring. Mm -hmm. What I did here is I put vegetable stock on top of it, and what I'm doing is let it simmer with a, with a, with a lid on it just to cook the vegetables and, uh, and to get everything uh, rolling here. Okay. Perhaps the most notable culinary treasure of Georgia's red dirt just behind the peach is the Vidalia onion. Sweet and mild, Vidalias blaze the way for other sweet onions in the American marketplace. Um, basically, in the 40s, before there was interstates and uh, really fast travel, on Highway 280, right out of Vidalia, there was a farmer, and his name was Moses Coleman. And he would sell his vegetables to people as they would go and come people would come back the next year and say, those onions were wonderful. They were so sweet. Why are those so sweet? And we did, really didn't know. And we found out that parts of 19 acres in Georgia has a very low sulfur content. And when you take the sulfur out of the soil, whatever you grow is sweeter. They're now uh, beginning to grow the Vidalia carrots sweet carrots. So um, that's basically how it got started. Then word spread that there's this little town in Georgia called Vidalia and they grow the sweetest onions there. So that's how it began. Vidalia onions are Ronnie Collins' life here at Plantation Sweets. Uh, actually I was born and raised right on this same farm here. Uh, my parents uh, were here for years and I took over this farming uh, venture back in 1976. 
since then, uh, my parents didn't really grow uh, Vidalia onions. They were a tobacco farming operation, and I have continued that. I still grow some tobacco, but it's not our main venture. Our main venture now is Vidalia onions, and uh, began that back in 1981, and I had 10 acres the first year. And we have grown to uh, 1,405 acres now. We have 13 different products that are made from the Vidalia onions. Um, some of those that you're trying today are... Which are what? Everything from barbecue sauce to relishes, right, salsa? Right, and a mustard spread, and uh, yes, just um, one thing that helped to take it to other parts of our country was the Vidalia marketing order that we obtained in 1989 to protect the name Vidalia. Um, so that's really how it um, began to spread, and of course, in the last six to seven years, you know, it's available now all of the United States and abroad. In the West, for example, we don't really see these big, beautiful Vidalias that often. It's normal little net bags with a pound, a pound and a half of Vidalias. Um, the buyers um, at the major chain stores find that a convenience. They, in fact, they're called consumer packs. Uh, but it does not give the true Vidalia representation. Um, we recommend that those are used for baking or cooking uh, because in cooking, it does bring out the, the sugar content. It does uh, bring out the sweetness. But a small onion is not going to be as sweet as the mature Vidalias. That's just a part of nature. Well, thank you so much. These are wonderful. I'm looking forward to having some of your dressing on a salad. Thank <laughs> you, and thank you for coming. And so now we've got it all cooked down. All those curry flavors are filling up the kitchen. Isn't, the scents. isn't that a, a aromatic? It's, oh. just, it's just beautiful. Um, also, I want to I want to just pick up the the nabe a little bit and show you how, it's, how it's simmering down, away yeah. and, and uh, how it's going and and. Uh, and you know what also about Japanese cooking that's so wonderful is the ceramic cookware. If you've ever had an opportunity to, if, if you see it, if you can go into a specialty store, an Asian store, and pick up some ceramic cookware, sometime in your life you owe it to yourself if you spend time in the kitchen. Because it really does cook your stocks and broths, and rice and vegetables, anything really. And it seems as though in rices in particular, and grains, it, it cooks them up more evenly and more quickly. Yes. And uh, it's just kind of, it's, it's just interesting to play with. Oh, it's 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 going very good, and I'm gonna I'm gonna season it up here. I'm gonna a, a little bit, and then I'm gonna actually at the end, I'm gonna add some miso to it. Right. And then I'm gonna add, add a little bit of soy sauce to it. Okay, so boy, that is it's relatively nice simple. What I'm gonna do here is take the curry okay. itself, and I'm gonna blend I'm it up. I'm moving out of your way. I'll take okay. this off for you, just and then take just off the back lid off. there, and I'm gonna mm. pour it directly into here and. Well, and you have a lot of a lot of personal experience with Japanese cooking too, because when you went over there and were kind of feeling your oats, you met a beautiful woman and you married sure her. Did. And you got he, he was telling me off camera that he hasn't been back to Japan in seven years. His wife is Japanese, and you have children, and she's over Two there right now. Two beautiful kids. And we're you get go, to go visit them we're and go visit pick Japan. Up, visit the family and. <laughs> Um, what I'm doing here is just basically straining this uh, curry sauce right into the vegetables itself. I'm going to turn up the heat a little bit. This is really unique. I, I have not seen this type of presentation, or not presentation, but preparation with right. a curry before. I guess that's why it's called the fuse box. That's kind of it right there. Okay, now this cooks down for... That's going to be about... Gosh, about 10 minutes or so. 10 and minutes, this and be... this thing is really going now. Yeah, it is. Well, while that cooks down, we also went over to the Four Seasons, and uh, their dessert chef showed us how to make a couple little delicacies. Uh -huh. We're here with pastry chef Joseph Teusler, and we're going to be making a couple of special treats today, a candied fruit peel, in this case grapefruit, and a raspberry sorbet, and at the very end we'll show you another unexpected little treat. So you start by taking off the peels of how many grapefruits for this recipe? I'm taking about three grapefruits. Okay. Okay. And I'm cutting the top off, and I'm cutting the bottom off. And now I cut the side, so cut it nice and round with a very sharp knife. I'm cooking these grapefruit peels to take the pita the pita skin off. The pita skin is the white skin. It's not really the skin on the outside. Oh, okay. okay. We need to. 
cook these peels here for about 10 minutes in hot water. In hot water, okay. And here we have some that have already been boiled. Okay, they were already boiled. And I'm removing now the skin. Taking the white part of the rind out. Yes. To get rid of the bitterness. Okay. The white skin has been removed. Now we're cutting these into the strips. Okay. Okay. I want the exact shape, so I'm cutting the, the bottom and the tops again off. So they're coming just like this. Okay, here's now one and a half pounds of sugar right in the pot. Two cups of water. And we're cooking this now. We're cooking this, let's say, for about 10 minutes mm -hmm. on a high flame. On a high flame, okay. Yes. Okay, the sugar has been cooked now. It's about 10 minutes on the stove. You see most of the, the water has been dissolved. It's poor sugar now. Yes. Okay. No, so it should have those nice big bubbles. The right? nice big bubbles and it's very, very thick as well. Okay. It's very thick. So now at this point, I'm sticking the strips in. And let it cook for another at least five minutes. Grapefruit peel has been cooked now. Okay. Now I need to strain it. I'm using here a sieve. And separate the sugar from the grapefruit peels. And I roll these here, so long they are hot, not when they are cold, into the sugar. So this, it looks like you need to move fairly quickly, so very you don't quickly, end up with it being too thick. Very quickly, don't forget, it's sugar, and sugar yes. sticks. With the finger, and really roll it in sugar. And the and excess I, will fall off. Yes, the excess it's will not fall absorbed. off. Uh -huh. So you see from three grapefruits you get quite an amount of quite grapefruit peels. It's a very old fashioned tree then think about we having grapefruits every day in the morning. But yes. we don't use the skin. That's true, we never use the skin. And I see off to the side someone brought over a beautiful little tray of cooled off and ready to serve candied grapefruit peel. And they're nice and rigid now. Nice now that and they've rigid. Cooled off. Stay in shape and very tasty. And all the excess sugar has already pretty much just fallen Removed, off. Removed, yes, yeah. it falls off. Now there's one other thing that I know you're probably not as well noted for, but not only do humans enjoy exquisite little treats coming out of your pastry kitchen, but our canine friends as well because you make them homemade dog peanut biscuits. butter dog biscuits. <laughs> These yes. are so cute. Yes. And a little These are dog amenities bowl. for our check-ins, for our friends, for our little friends. And he told me off camera, he's actually tried them. They're not <laughs> bad. You know, we were talking about miso um, a little bit ago, which is a soy-based product. Now, also, tofu is getting a really good rap these That's correct, days because correct. it's being credited with not only being a low-fat and alternative source of protein for the body, but also phytoestrogens and has other type of nutrients in it that the it body sure really, does. most bodies do really well with. You know. And mm -hmm. for this particular dish, you're going to be adding some more tofu to I'm this? I'm going to add a little bit more tofu. Um, I, I, to be honest with you, I don't think anybody could have enough tofu. <laughs> and um, what I did is I, I pressed it to get some of that water out. So let's talk about that. First okay. of all, I want to find out from you what, um, which density you use. I use a firm one. Um, this is a Japanese tofu. Every Asian culture has a different tofu. Mm -hmm. This is more of a silken, firm tofu. Now, talk about pressing the moisture out of it. Um, how do you go about mm -hmm. that? Is it as simple as just putting weight on yeah, it? Yeah, what I do is I just put a lid on top of that and a couple very, very light rice bowls. Actually, here's a, here's oh, a pretty okay. good demonstration right here. There I just go. stuck that on top of it and pressed it, and you can tell by there's the end, liquid. There's liquid coming out. Okay, and this is to help it keep its form. Yeah, and, and it also doesn't add that water back into that okay. into the thing. And that's that's another thing with tofu. How is they do it? You need to have it fresh. You can't let it sit it. around your refrigerator. And then, how, how often would you recommend changing the water on it if you're um, going to buy some and let it sit? I, I would say eat your tofu every day. Okay. <laughs> yeah, All right. Not let no it sit. No letting that it was, sit around. This is basically what I'm going to do. Is just add add cut it. Take a knife and cut it very gently on, okay. on, a, on a dish there. And then just add a couple pieces to, to the product itself. Because tofu is so good. 
And it'll pretty much and just take see, on all those flavors. You can see how the, how the curry just absorbed all that vegetable and, and it's loose and now it's, now it's got a whole bunch more liquid to it, but it's still thick. I like it's the drama. It's still a very sauce consistency. Yeah. And that's what, what, what pureeing up all those vegetables and the, and the carrots and the apples and stuff does to it. It's very sweet also. Um, my next thing here, we're gonna add a little bit of miso to, to, the, to the nave itself. And what that's gonna do, it's gonna give it a little bit more complex. Is this a white or yellow? This is a white miso, it's okay. soy. Um, usually the, your misos are based upon what the miso's made out of. Right. Barley, uh, soybeans different ingredients, how aged, how long it's aged and stuff will give it the different colors. Because you can get it anywhere from very pale to deep red. Deep red. And what I'm doing here is just putting it oh, through a screen. Interesting. Okay. So you don't get little clumps. I was wondering how you were going to add it at the end. And then what you do, it, this dish is finished now. You don't want to, you don't want to boil the flavor out of the miso. And that's that's you need a any lot soy of soy sauce. I'm not seeing any soy yeah, sauce here. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna put it at the end also. I don't I don't like to cook soy a whole lot, and miso you you just you just lose the flavor there. Well, after not only you that, I it. think I think a lot of the nutrients are reliant upon not overcooking miso too. That's correct. It's okay to heat it, but yeah, you well, really you, shouldn't cook yeah, it. Yeah, your flavors just the enzymes. Yeah, just go away if you do that. Okay, and then I want to find mm. out about this guy. When, that when guy's we're ready, a I, little slicky. I'm gonna, I'm gonna add a little piece at the end, and, <laughs> and, and basically we're gonna be done here. We're gonna add. We can't go till we find out about this. Now, this is this is called a slicky. They the Japanese they have the the interesting gadgets. Um, what we do is put roasted sesame seeds and black sesame seeds, and it's a grinder. And what it does is just grinds. Interesting. It sure is. It's <laughs> it's it's very very a good. A little slicky, a little yep. sesame seed I'm grinder. Gonna, First I've ever seen on <clears> that. And what I do at the end of, of, of the the nave is I pour a little fresh, good mm. a, a good soy sauce, not a not a real cheap one, but. Well. Uh, do you use a shoyu sauce? This, this is a, actually a tamari, and this is this is all done. This is this is our dish. And well, now, will you finish that up, and we put it in a, a little mm. serving bowl? We're Absolutely. going to go to our wine consultant, David Berkeley, and find out what he would be serving with today's recipes. The Fuse Box offers flavors that are among America's favorite, particularly with its continuing affection for fusion flavors. Now we could suggest some wines that we have in the past that offer sort of tropical fruit, and they would be nice. And beer, well beer would be great, but I'm going to suggest a potent rice wine known as sake. Now this adventure back into the world of sake, well, it's going to be different because it's not going to be traditional hot sake, but rather chilled sake. Now sake, while we call it a rice wine, really has characteristics more like beer because it is fermented rice. But the alcohol levels are more consistent with wine, higher, and the flavors that we describe are more consistent with wine, sort of complex fruit aromas and tropical flavors and crisp aftertaste. Serve this chilled and you'll enjoy it very much with these dishes. Oh, this smells wonderful. So, everything's so fresh and beautiful, the, the presentation. And I want to thank you so much for sharing these exotic dishes that you've Very created welcome. from around the world. Until next time, Sante. Okay. To find out more about Regina's vegetarian table, visit our PBS website at pbs.org.